Pick it off with roll call or you want to say it? Yes, if you first? could take it off with roll call and just a reminder to everybody, if you could give us any updates going on in your communities, that would be fabulous. All right, so first of all, we're going to welcome a uh, new member, Portia Fisher. Um, give her an opportunity to introduce herself. You make her go first. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. We always do. <laughs> Hello. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Portia Fisher, and I'm so happy to join you this evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I am the Education and Registry Manager in the Center for Health and Community Impact at Wayne State University, uh, where we are uh, running several different grants to train community health workers to share climate action information and education with vulnerable members of marginalized communities. And prior to that, I worked at the Michigan Community Health Worker Alliance, where we created um, a climate change impacts course for community health workers and other paraprofessionals para in um, underserved communities in Metro Detroit and across the state of Michigan to share important climate action, education, health interventions, and messages with um, vulnerable populations. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. You're going to be a great voice to have with us. So, thank all you. right, Kelly. Gave me a minute to get my food on the microwave, too. Okay. So thank you. You want me to gab <laughs> more? Or, right. <laughs> Angela. We have Angela on. Mm -hmm. She's. Oh, you had yourself on there, Angela. Needed. Try it again. She was unmuted for a second, but I don't. So she must be having some trouble with the thing. So, but Brad. she is here. Uh, yep, present, and I do not have anything uh, new to update for the uh, the area. Thanks. Thank you, Connie. Uh, okay. Go ahead. I hope you can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, the biggest news in our area uh, happened a couple days ago, and it is a, a line broke in a plating plant that had been sold uh, about a year ago, and it made Bear Creek, which goes into the Clinton River, which goes into Lake St. Clair turquoise in color. Uh, copper concentrations are supposed to be extremely high for fish. And of course, it has a lot of PFAS. And the one I did look at some of the sampling results and the catch basin seemed to have some huge concentrations of PFAS, PFOA in particular. Okay, that's it for my end. All right. I'm going to mute Thank myself now. Yep. Thank you. Star six, or you want me to mute you? Yeah, mute me, Kelly. Okay, I will. Okay, Dan Brown is not here. Um, Dave Wen. Anybody see Dave on? Nope. Okay. I don't, unless he's one of the phone numbers, but I don't see him. Gail Dugan. So, uh, Jason Legowski said that he might not be able to join tonight, and I don't see him on. Joe, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, John Vries. Yep, I'm here. Lynn Knopf. Lynn McIntosh. Lynn was trying. She'll probably call us at some point. Mm -hmm. okay. Mary? I'm here. Oh, and that, can I uh, give an update here? Uh, okay. We heard from Abby and the site lead yesterday that in Holly, Ego RRD has authorized $160,000 to use in 2024 
toward further site work and the Falk Road dump um, and also two uh, off-site properties to do some um, more drilling there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Patty Baldwin said she wasn't going to be able to join tonight. Rick? Um, no updates. I'm here. <laughs> Tandy? Um, yeah, I'm here. Um, I don't know if we talked about these Wolverine updates last time. There was another uh, more contamination found over by the headquarters, and that site is kind of expanded. I think the area around there has. So um, I don't know how many wells are affected by that or anything right now. I think we're all still trying to gather some information. So stay tuned. And you have a, a CAG meeting for Wolverine this week too, right? Yes, we have a CAG meeting Thursday that I think we're, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, but I think we're planning on getting all the uh, updates on all the sites at that time. Shalene. Stacy Taylor. Tony. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, a few updates. <clears throat> First of all, um, in our school to this past month, the, the Defense Department announced two more interim remedies uh, for uh, the Osabo River uh, as part of the uh, national policy directive that was issued last July um, based on the model that we put forth at Oscoda and took to the Defense Department. Uh, that's a, a very substantial, uh, a big deal for us. Uh, and then this past week, the uh, Under Secretary of Defense announced uh, a total of 40 uh, sites across the country at which that model is, is and has been uh, being employed on for the interim remedies and uh, pleased to report that grayling is is on that list and i know some of those remedy cleanup remedies are underway um also want to uh, shout out to mary blanchard there was a no defense screening here in troy uh in late january uh sponsored by representative sharon mcdonald and had a nice turnout and Mary Blanchard uh, set up a table there on behalf of the COG and provided a lot of really helpful information. I know the folks and uh, there is a, the next no defense screening and Q and A is gonna be in Traverse City on the evening of March the 1st. And uh, I will send out uh, info, I, I'm not sure exactly the venue, but it's, it's like six to eight o'clock, I believe on the 1st of March, I'll shoot out information as soon as I have it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Bill Barnett. Samra. I think Samra's here on the phone. Hi, everybody. Um, yep. Hi, everyone. Um, no real update on where I'm at. Thank you, Samra. Christine. Daniel Burlingame, David Norwood, Elizabeth, Gail Manswitz, Jeffrey Dutton, Justin, And Harvey, Laura Ogar, Leah, Margaret, Pam McQueer, Richard Burns, Bob Pataki. Teresa Landrum, Tyler Mitchell. It does look like Lynn um, <clears throat> McIntosh is on the phone. Or yeah, like, I, I, I just, can you hear me? I just joined in. Yep. Yes. 
Okay, and great. This is Gail Mance. This is Gail Manswitz. I'm on the phone as well. All right. Thank you. You guys got any updates? Uh, well, I still have a concern for the Rockford situation and what's happening with the 11 mile site. And I don't have any updates, but I'll be curious to know what the next round of testing shows. All right. And I have no updates. It's just, I, just to tag onto that, I want to know when those tests uh, are coming for 11 right. miles. We're looking forward to, to Thursday then. Okay. Um, Angela put in the chat that she was in a meeting, so that's why she couldn't jump off for mute. So I think that's everybody. Um, thank you, everyone. So I thought this, tonight we're going to go into subcommittee reports and then we'll do some updates and stuff, kind of some housekeeping stuff, I guess this meeting is. So um, anything on the website review subcommittee? Did that? Y oh, yes, there. we met. We messed at 430. This is Brad Benman um, and uh, had a, a good discussion. Um, Kelly is is uh, good working with the web. Uh, update folks to uh, potentially uh, do a little bit of uh, additional link, uh, add an additional link to uh, with regards to uh, uh, PFAS cost foam and foam reporting. Um, I also wanted to. Um, chat a little bit about you know I went through and and uh, there there's some useful there is some you I, I want to say new to me information it's not necessarily brand new but uh, when we were going through the the uh, uh, guide to residents or resources for residents um, there is the in the take action page there is some information um, that's helpful I think uh, regarding um, other ways to uh, uh, if you like click into the um, uh, scroll down a little bit more, Kelly. Uh, there you go to the avoiding PFAS and consumers products. Um, there's some there's some pretty decent, uh, relatively new fact sheets in the um, um, link from down 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 to the North Northeast Waste Management Officials Association PFAS fact sheets. So um, it, I think uh, if you're in meetings that uh, people, you know, you want to provide additional information be beyond um, uh, what we normally get under uh, uh, our our own information, these are, are pretty decent um, fact sheets and they give you some some guidance, general guidance as far as what to look for and what to be skeptical of when people are making claims about PFAS in uh, um, in cookware and clothing and that type of thing. So I would encourage people to uh, potentially look at those and share information if if somebody has questions. That's That'd great. Be it. Anybody have questions or comments on that? The thing I would just mention, Kelly, if you go back to that is um, really trying to encourage people just to use this. It's only been out for a month or two, Kelly. When do we put this up? End of December, beginning of January? Yeah, I want to say it's probably been about a month now, month and a half. Uh, we did look at the analytics on it. It's the 17th most viewed page right now on our website. Um, so we're getting there. And, yep. Um, the thing I would just like to point back out to people that I think is really cool is, is the fact that you can go by product. So if she scrolls down just a little bit, you can go by product. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for new carpet in your house or you're looking for whatever the particular product is, you can see which of the websites actually deals with that. So show them how to, how to uh, go up just a little bit, Cal, where it actually goes under product categories there. You can search by the category you're looking for and then see which of these websites will have something that will apply to your particular product i think that's the easiest way to use it um so because there's not a ton of websites that have stuff yet for pfas specifically um but this is everybody we could find 
So if you see anybody else out there who's got additional information on PFAS uh, products or, um, you know, is doing the screenings for PFAS products, uh, let us know and we can continue to add to this. But this is, I thought was, you know, it's all the information we can find specifically on, on PFAS without doing the test. And of course, this is, you know, we're not verifying any of this. This is all as reported on the websites, so. That's pretty Thanks. impressive, though. That website, cool. while it's a little cumbersome, is a really good website. I know people from other states that use this website, so it, mm -hmm. it should be a model for other states. It really is good. So Yeah, about half our traffic is from other states. <laughs> so, you know, it's getting a lot of views. That's good. Anything else for the website? Thank you, Brad, for doing all that. Uh, any other questions for the website, folks? All right. Um, is prevention here? That's usually, I think, are the prevention people here? Yes, Angela, think, it is a good resource. Go ahead. I Who's that? Is that Mary? This is Mary. Um, I just wanted to say I, prevention group has not met, and uh, Dave's not on here to report that. So. Okay. Um, and just real quick, I don't know if you saw Kelly that Stacy Taylor is here. She had trouble getting on. So mark her here. Thank um, you. Engaging the public subcommittee. I can uh, let you know that we did meet and uh, Dr. Portia Fisher, that was her first meeting with us. And actually, we talked some about the survey, and she has all kinds of ideas on how we can do actually a survey going forward <laughs> and have it uh, be a lot more uh, friendly than what I could do. And uh, she also said that the advantage of doing that type of a survey is that you can get analysis and that off of it uh, that would be really helpful to us. So. Um, Thank you very much. We will look forward to that. Um, the other thing we talked about, um, Brandon Thomas from MDHHS was on with us. And before the other people joined, he and I were talking about um, how uh, it's good to have different perspectives. Um, and Rick Radisky is a great uh, example of that because when he's on the uh, he has the perspective of not only his uh, years of experience with working with the university, but also with the state and with um, citizens when he's working with citizen groups. So we appreciate all of that. And Brandon said he's able to use that type of information when he is working with uh, the citizens that he comes in contact with with his job. And then Kelly did um, share with us uh, as far as with Eagle, that they're getting lots of new uh, site leads and they have a hundred right now. And when she first started, there were only 45 sites and now there are 275 with a hundred site leads. Um, she and Amy also are uh, responsible for giving education and uh, details to those a hundred uh, site leads that change frequently. Um, on how to uh, work with the MPART team and that type of information. So we can all appreciate um, how difficult that must be for Kelly and Amy and the rest of the MPART staff in keeping keeping up to date. <laughs> so thank you very much. All right. So I hear, um, look forward to more surveys. We have more surveys coming and that's good. But <laughs> actually Lynn had suggested that as well. She sent me a email after she had done her survey and said that uh, SurveyMonkey or you know one of those sites would be uh, easy to set up just as uh, Portia said and uh, be able to give some uh, good feedback on it too. So great, good. And thank you Mary for um, doing that outreach at the no defense screening for more members. I think the more people we have, the more varied views we get. And I think that's really important. So 
Yeah, you know, um, we, we had, a, I'm sorry, uh, Tony had a good turnout. Uh, unfortunately, it was also the same day as the Lions uh, last game when they <laughs> had the, uh, you know, the unfortunate uh, loss there. But um, I, I think there were more people who would have come had it not been the Lions game that day. So sure. we'll look forward to uh, future showings. Um, the last committee is membership. And Mary, I wonder if you want to wait because we have quite a bit on the agenda for membership. Do you want to just wait and do all of that then? Yeah, that's no problem okay. at all. Yeah. All right. So with that, Abby, I'll hand it to you to do any updates. Yeah, OK. Um, thanks for that. And um, I think we've got a few people uh, previewing, uh, sitting in to this meeting as well that might be thinking about becoming uh, COG members as well. So happy, welcome to everybody who's uh, new to the to the group and to this meeting. Um, so last month I was asked to go down as um, uh, and do a keynote speech or one of the keynote speeches for uh, what we call an Air and Waste Management Association meeting uh, conference down in North Carolina. So it's a great opportunity. These particular meetings in particular are um, really great opportunities to get uh, you know, kind of a firsthand look at what's going on with EPA because it's basically in their backyard of the EPA Research Triangle Park in uh, Raleigh. And so you get a lot of the ground floor data from the guys that are working on all kinds of things. So we talked um, a lot about research methods um, and the things that they're working on behind the scenes. I was frankly very, very encouraged to hear all of the things that they've got going on in the background to understand um, method development for um, air methods. They just came up with two new stack tests methods for um, PFAS and air. Oh, uh, OTM is other test method, OTM 45 and 50. Um, that'll help in the in the long run in understanding PFAS. They've also got something they call a um, rainbow furnace down there. And so they basically have this large furnace in their research lab that every single color of the furnace is a different temperature um, for the furnace. And so what they're looking for is to see as they raise the temperature and other conditions in this furnace as to what kinds of PFAS, uh, what temperature are they incinerating, what chain length of PFAS, and then what are they getting out for emissions? So they're trying to understand it. Can we do incineration of PFAS? What temperature does it need? They did have some exciting um, information that they think that if they add some, some um, water vapor to it at certain temperatures, they might be able to eliminate a lot of what they call the products of incomplete combustion, which is one of the issues that we've been having with, um, or one of the reasons that nobody really likes the incineration too much is because we have uh, products of incomplete combustion that happen and we don't know enough about what that means in, you know, the fact that they're just discharged into the air is obviously not something that we want to see. So uh, very excited to hear about a lot of those things. There's stuff going on in the toxicology side where they're looking at um, faster ways to try to do um, instead of doing full blown animal studies for some of the data on uh, on long-term health effects. They're looking at doing shorter ones with a little less data, a little less certainty, but faster. Um, so that, you know, there's trade-offs with all this stuff, but it it's a new approach um, for some of the epidemiological research that needs to be done in order to have um, uh, chemicals actually get onto EPA's, what they call their IRIS um, database. That process usually takes about eight years to get a chemical on there to make sure all of the studies are done appropriately and they would do them with um and there's people that could probably talk about that more than i can um but uh that process they're looking at trying to speed up with some of these other potential studies so we'll see what comes of it um i thought it was pretty interesting and 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 frankly pretty exciting to hear about um there were other presentations from 
in the states of New York, um, Massachusetts, um, New Jersey, North Carolina. Um, and so it was, again, really exciting to hear from them some of the stuff they're working on. They're starting to catch up. Um, most everybody's, at least in those states, are doing drinking water sampling, uh, but they're also starting to do landfill sampling, and they're starting to do some of these uh, other AFFF pickup and collection programs like we've done. So we're getting there. We're starting to get some company. Um, but at one point, um, at one point, the one of the participants in the in the thing asked a question of the presenter and said, well, where do we get sampling guidance? Where do we get, you know, um, additional information? And and the <laughs> and one of the main conference organizers turned and looked at me and said, well, you can go to the Empire website and get that. <laughs> so I said, yep, it's there. It's there. We've got it there for a while. Um, apparently, we're only one of like two states that have got any kind of real sampling guidance. So I thought that was pretty funny. But a lot of accolades for the work that Michigan has done and for um, the amount of just how far advanced we are with the from the rest of the country uh but as i was trying to explain to everybody it's like you know it's one thing to be out in front but we need everybody else to get there as well because we do need this to advance to the national level so that everybody's got safe drinking water and that we're all playing with the same rules um having having different standards in different states is not working. Um, obviously, Michiganders are protected, but in the long run, we want everybody in the country to have drinking water that's all meeting acceptable standards. So the hope is um, that EPA is still on schedule to uh, get those MCLs for drinking water out. Um, I haven't heard anything different, but end of February, beginning of March, maybe the end of March, somewhere in there we should be getting, yeah, I know, fingers crossed, we should be getting um, primary drinking water standards. Um, and I think I saw Ian on if he's got anything different, but um, so that was one thing. The other thing that um, I'll just throw out there for you guys is uh, the RICRA update. So, uh, RICRA is um, usually part of the its national um, uh, regulations around hazardous waste. Um, what they are looking at doing is making PFOS and and well nine different PFOS, including PFOA and PFOS, um, listing nine of the PFOS um, uh, substances as hazardous constituents, and the wording is really important here, hazardous constituents would make it applicable under RICRA so that um, people who are subject to RICRA requirements uh, would be, you know, at least at the state level, we could ask them to do investigations specifically for PFAS um, without having that in there before. There was always some question as to whether or not you could require somebody to do a PFAS investigation under RICRA. And so now EPA is going to clarify that with um, their, their latest update. It's out for public comment. That won't officially go into effect and probably until probably sometime next year after they go through public comment period and stuff. So um, that one will start rolling out. The drinking water is farther along. And then the other one that we didn't list here is the CERCLA. That will be um, also listing PFOA and PFOS as hazardous con uh, substances, contaminants. I think it's hazardous substances under CERCLA, which again um, allows those sites that are regulated under federal law, like our, a lot of our Superfund sites are regulated under CERCLA, um, that we can ask them as well to do um, uh, cleanups for PFAS. So, um, you know, Sandy, that would have been a lot easier when we were doing the Wolverine case, um, but that was not not the case at that point. So. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. Um, I'm just wondering, especially for the new people, if you could give um, explanation on those letter uh, type things like RICRA and that. Yeah, so the the short version of it, I, we can dump them in the chat. If somebody would dump Circla and, and RICRA in the chat for me uh, with the websites, that would be great. Um, RICRA is a hazardous waste law for 
at the federal level. And then CERCLA is your comprehensive environmental um, uh, recovery law. That is um, this it's the super fun. It's a super fun program at the federal level. We've taken our state program our what we call our 201 program for uh, cleanups in Michigan is based off of that. Only we have different liability schemes. So um, federal level has CERCLA, state level has part 201. Uh, we can use state requirements for cleanup of state sites. In the case where we've got Superfund sites specifically, um, a lot of those, can, we can apply the state standards, but they're using the federal um, CERCLA liability and structure. So the, the CERCLA program itself has a very structured way of going through their site assessment work, and it usually takes a lot longer and it's a little bit more rigid in the way things progress through it. So like Tony was talking about doing interim response remedies um, or interim action remedies. Uh, I've got the acronym backwards, but the um, that's really a big deal because normally you wouldn't get to a remedy or any kind of a smaller remedy for the site um, until you get to a certain part of the process. And by... Um, DOD allowing that to happen earlier in the process before you're maybe all the way through investigation phase is a really big deal in the CERCLA process. And so, um, you know, kudos to Tony and for all the work that he's done to try to propel that behind the scenes, um, because that is a, a huge, um, it's a huge coup for for all of our DOD sites uh, in the country, because it's that, you know, frankly, it's just not happened in a very long time, if ever. So, um, but yeah, did somebody get those acronyms in there? Yes, thank you, Mike Jerry. Thank and you. I think Angela put those in there too. So perfect. That that was perfect. I think the um, circular designation will be huge for us with PFAS contamination sites because that's been a big stumbling block. Yes, too. it does not make every site with PFAS contamination a super fun site. So just right. know that that does not that's not the way that's going to work. Um, and but most of help. those. Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. If we need to do enforcement actions or we're having trouble with um, a particular site, having the Superfund sites be able to look for PFAS and um, clean up to PFAS standards is really important. And the, those sites can still use our state standards for groundwater cleanup, it, you know, since we've got we've got some groundwater cleanup numbers. So. All right. Um, yes, thank you, Amy, for putting that in the chat. Um, the other thing I'll just mention is we did get a, um, a response from the Supreme Court's decision to uh, hear our case for our drinking water rules. So, um, you know, the Court of Appe or the Supreme Court's decision uh, to review the uh, Court of Appeals' opinion on this. So the Court of Appeals said that we had not done enough um, uh, due diligence on understanding um, the cost for implementing the drinking water standards at 201 sites. And uh, so anyways, it's going to go to the Supreme Court. I'm not going to get into all the details because that's not my uh, bailiwick. But we're, we're excited that the Supreme Court is actually going to hear that decision. In the meantime, all of our drinking water standards are still in effect. They all still have enforceability um, and there's nothing going to change at this point. So um, and the same thing for when we get to having EPA give us the drinking water standards uh, with the MCLs. That'll have to go through a promulgation process, um, but nothing's going to change in the meantime. So just rest assured as you're seeing those articles come out. And that's my cue because Kelly's telling me to hurry up. OK, um, so for new sites, we do have a couple of new sites. Um, yeah, Joe, you want to uh, ask a question first? Yes, yeah, so quickie. Uh... The incinerator study is very interesting. We do have many incinerators in the state of Michigan too. So do you 
know when they'll publish the results? Um, I don't. I don't. You're talking about the EPA studies, right? Yeah. I don't. Um, I will. Yeah. You know that stuff's all coming out of the Office of Research and Development. So if you go to EPA's website in in Office of Research and Development, you might be able to log in and get some updates from them periodically. Okay. Um, but okay. that's something that they've been working on for a couple, well, for quite a while now. Um, but it sounds like they're actually making some really good progress. Um, so I think that's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. Plus, having now the other um, air methods for stack testing will be really important yes. um, because we didn't have that before. Um, but that's that's stack testing. We still right, don't right, have right. an ambient air monitoring method yet for PFAS. Um, you know, other than we've got some we've got some um, uh, disc like things. Um, but yeah, so for that incinerator stuff, we will we'll continue to keep an eye on it. And as I see stuff, I can pass it along if you guys are interested. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Go ahead, John. Yeah, um, for folks living near a landfill, is the air quality uh, an issue for on the PFAS side, what you just mentioned? I mean, I wasn't aware that uh, we didn't have a test method for PFAS for air quality. Um, um, well, anywhere? there's a couple there's a couple of things. Um, one, we don't have a lot of air quality um, um, sampling around landfills. Um, first of all, most of the PFAS is not volatile. There are some, but not most of what we're most concerned with with PFOS, PFOA is not in the volatile nature. So it's not going to um, evaporate what happens and when it becomes an issue is this if you have stack emissions then it can be um, emitted out uh, of the stack or be attached to like a dust particle or something like oh, that okay. um, but it usually is like attached so we do get PFAS that can travel the little bit of data we've got from the uh, or the data that we do have from the um, integrated atmospheric network and I got Mike Jury pop that into the into the chat for me. This IDEM or um, IADEM, I think it is Integrated Atmospheric uh, Deposition Network or something along those lines. They've done PFAS testing uh, for EPA uh, regionally, and we're not seeing too much in the air regionally. But we do know that it can be an issue if you have um, specific sources. So I think the landfill question probably needs to be answered more, but I don't think at this point I'm not seeing anything in the in the research that's making me really uncomfortable. I think there are okay. certain questions that we would need to have answered, but we don't have um, specific methodologies, you know, for for just doing ambient air around landfills. I don't think so. I don't okay. Think so. How about how about for uh, friable asbestos? Do we have air air quality tests for that exposure? Ooh. Mike Jerry, you know off the top of your head? Sure. There's a method to do that. You take sa air samples using a filter system, and then you count the fibers under a microscope. Oh goodness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a, a test method that I could look up, or is there something? Um, that's probably not something that a citizen could do. That's just something that a technician needs to do, probably. Uh, give me a, yeah, you. So there's, um, depending on if you're doing it for an individual, which would be an occupational health study, there's a different method to do that versus another method to do it uh, in outdoor air. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I. And I it seems like we've got projects where we've asked for, um, you know, asbestos sampling in air when they're taking down stacks, when they're taking down buildings and stuff. I know we often will do perimeter monitoring for uh, asbestos as well. So okay, because we've we've had a recent you know asbestos kind of thing going on right now in our local friendly little landfill over here, um, and the neighbors are a little worried about you know what's the probability of anything propagating to their house across the street and we I'm not I'm not even sure 
if there is real risk there, I, I don't really know how to measure we'll that. Get, we'll get you a person. How about that? Okay. Great, thanks. <laughs> if somebody can drop Heidi Hollenbach's uh, name in the chat for, for John, because that's who he needs to talk to. So, all right, great conversation. You guys are geeking out on me on today on the science stuff. I didn't come prepared. Um, hey, Abby, can I ask a real quick question about that yeah. air thing? You know, there was the article about the PFAS in the rain that fell on, you know, Sleeping yes. Bear Dunes and I know St. Cobain and some of these other places. So through the stacks is really an issue if we're getting PFAS in our rain, correct? Um, From other well, areas. Let's, let's back up because the, the, the article that was put out that it said it's raining PFAS was bad data. So the the unfortunately what happened is the researcher um, who was doing the study had a had a student who was uh, had put that particular data out for you know a small conference or whatever, uh, but there was an actually um, a a quantification error in there. She had too many zeros or um, yeah. But, it but was they've had that be, issue in in like Wilmington, North Carolina, and St. Cobain, and Merrimack, yes. some of these places that we have seen so, PFAS travel in the air, right? Yes, you can definitely see PFAS travel in the air. So okay. in the areas where you've got like Camores down in, in yeah. Fayette, Fayetteville, we know that PFAS, they've got stack emissions, you know, they've been working to reduce them, but they've had stack emissions over the last, you know, 30 years where they've now tracked it out 25 miles. That, so when we go back and talk to our communities, though, the issue of air quality is more of a concern when you have stack emissions than it is if you're next yeah. to a landfill or a tannery or, okay, yes. Yes. that's what, that's yes. all I was trying to get out. So. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, I, I think there's always possibilities for sp specific site stuff, but we... Um, you know, would have to be able to take measurements and know what the loading is and the stack height and all that kind of stuff. So it's not something easy to guess. Let me put it that way. I've asked on a couple of different particular situations that um, want to kind of see if we, and it's going to be kind of hard to understand after the fact. So thank you, Amy. And Amy just put in there um, a whole bunch of stuff on some air monitoring study that was done in 2022 uh, at 27 different locations here in Michigan with Harvard University in Rhode Island or University of Rhode Island. So um, get that out of the chat because that's I forgot all about that, Amy. Thanks for reminding me on that one. Um, Gail, did you have your hand up? Who's got their hands up? Gail. Yes. Does. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what is stack emission? Stack emissions are going to be those um, that are actually coming out of, you know, a very large, usually a pretty large um, uh, direct discharge to the air. So it's going to be the smokestacks that you see coming out of factories or, um, you know, there's there's some in, in Grand Rapids that you see all the time. But those are going okay. to be your stack emissions versus just so, something that's got a roof vent. OK, essentially industrial. Usually, yes, it's always okay. going to be industrial. I don't know if we've got any air quality people on here today, but from my understanding, it's always going to be industrial. Okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. I should have my air people on today. Um, or Stacey. commercial, Abby. Oh, industrial what? or commercial. Yeah. Yeah, can you think of a like a commercial sure. stack emission? Sure. Um, greenhouse so that they're heating their greenhouse with heating oil or uh, natural gas. That would be a commercial operation. Um, how about a uh, place that makes food, cheese, milk, dried milk? You'd have emissions off of those, and those would be a commercial. Okay. Shouldn't be PFAS coming off of them, but they would be considered a stack emission. Depends on what they're manufacturing. <laughs> it all does. It's that it does. All right. Thank you, Mike. Abby, um, would that also include utility uh, stacks? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're way off of topic today, but that's this is a good conversation. Stacy's got her hand up. Stacy, can you get yourself unmuted today? Woohoo! All right.
I can see you're unmuted, Stacy, but we don't hear you. Okay, hey, Stacy, keep your hand up. We're going to go to Rick. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, another way to to look at it to explain it better would be um, we call it uh, stationary sources. Um, you know, stack emissions are stationary uh, sources of the pollution. So, uh, I mean, I, I typically would use stationary source over stacks. I mean, but we talk about stack sampling and things like that. But uh, it's mm -hmm. any, you know, fixed source, like, you know, you have a car, which would be a mobile source. Um, but uh, the stack emissions are just like a point source water pollution scenario. So I just mm -hmm. want to bring that up. That's a good good analogy, yep. Rick. Um, I am not an air quality specialist. Mm -hmm. Just to make no amends here, there's, I am not in that world. Um, Mike did dabble in it though, so Mike's got a couple of uh, decade or more of air quality experience. So fourteen years. There we go. Mike, Mark, Mike's done everything. All right. Um, and Stacy, if we can't get, let's see, did she put something in the chat? Um, Incomplete burning was one of the concerns. Okay. Yeah. So that would not be what we would consider a stack emission would not be like open burning. That's, that's not, um, you know, um, while it might be a, a stationary source and that that's not going anywhere, but um, it's not the same thing as what we would, what we would use for stack or have call stack emissions. All right. Good conversation. Um, so one of the other things I'll just bring up um, our MPART sites, areas of interest. We've got two new ones, um, the 515 North Union Street in Ithaca is a facility that was um, formerly owned by Wolverine back um, 10, 15 years ago. Um, we did find PFAS there. More investigations going on because there's been several owners and we're not sure who do, has done what, um, but that investigation is ongoing. And then the West Marquette County Sanitation Authority landfill up in Ishpeming. So um, those are both on the on the MPART website. Um, we got several more in the queue to to be um, added in as well. So we're continuing to add things and um, and God bless Amy and Kelly for keeping all of our site leads straight and trying to keep track of who's going where because there's a lot of people uh, moving around. So, all right. Are I there, think... Can I ask Gabby, are there going to be town halls or anything near any either of those two sites or do you have any town halls coming up? I don't Thanks. I didn't so. see any on the calendar, but no. And I, it's been kind of quiet. We've been asking people if they want um, town halls. Those have been kind of quiet. Uh, getting a lot of requests for presentations and talking one on one with people. But um, as far as I can remember, there are not any. Amy Kelly, you can give us a thumbs up, but I don't think. We've got any else, any other on? We don't uh, have any community meetings on the books. Okay. Happy to do them, but we don't have any at this point, so. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for all those updates, Abby. That's great. Lots coming up, hopefully. Hopefully new policy changes coming up, so. Um, all right. Mary, I'm going to let you take it from here. <laughs> Well, thanks, Sandy. <laughs> as, far, as far as the uh, cleanup of the membership list, um, I did want to let people know that we did send out a letter to the 11 members that uh, had not attended a meeting during 2023, and I did get three responses back. Um, Justin Petak uh, said he would like to be removed. And so we are, are going to do that. But I did get two letters and I would like to read them to you. Um, asking to, um, well, specifically, um, Mickey Brum uh, from Marquette. Uh, she did ask uh, to please keep me on the active list as I have several projects underway in the area of PFAS. Sincerely, uh, Mickey Brum. Um, she had been in contact with me previously 
uh, about the fact that she does have a, it's either an elected position or an appointed position to a local um, board or, or uh, something like that in her local area that prevents her from coming to this meeting. Um, but she has participated in the past with surveys and um, even just emails on comments of uh, things that have gone on with um, other emails from uh, members. So I wanted to bring that up and I told her that I would get back to her. The other Can person- ask, um, How would she vote if she can't show up to meetings? Well, I, I think uh, we're gonna have to talk about that because Abby had a concern about that as well. Okay. Um, the other person um, was Dave Norwood. And just for um, people to understand, he is a municipal services director in Canton Township. And he um, said, thank you for the email mes message. I completely understand. I, however, interested in the work of the COG based on my roles and responsibilities for the Charter Township of Canton. My department manages the water system in Canton and we pay close attention to any impact on that system. If possible, I would like to stay abreast of the work of the COG and, and I am deeply interested in the messages that are shared about M, uh, PFAS impacts throughout the state and the country. I consider the folks on the COG as not only state, but national, and he has in parentheses, maybe global leaders in this field. Thank you again, and I completely understand the actions on this issue by the COG, uh, Dave Norwood. So um, I don't know that he's necessarily asking to stay active as much as just wanting to be informed. And we had a leadership meeting um, with Abby and Kelly and uh, Jason and Sandy and I, and we did discuss the fact that um, there might be other people as well that would be interested in just being on a notification list, uh, just like sharing information as we get it. So, you know, that might be something that, I don't know, membership or, you know, even the COG in general, uh, how you would feel about that. But um, that, I guess that's uh, one thing we did vote last month on cleaning up the membership list of those people who um, had not attended. And I think the only two that are in question at this point is Mickey Brum and uh, Dave Norwood. So um, I know Abby, you had uh, specifically mentioned about a concern with the voting as well. Yeah, I don't know if it's a concern. I just it's um, and I don't know, maybe maybe these people are going back and, and watching the recording later on so they can actually catch up because, you know, we're not sending out a lot of emails with the updates that we talk about during the meeting. So I just wonder how they're getting the information. But um, I'm going to leave it kind of up to you guys. Um, you know, I don't anybody can can sign up and be. Um, or can attend the meetings. So it's not like anything's terribly top secret, but you guys really wanted to be able to count voting members. So I don't know if we want to do a associate members or something like that, where you leave them as a member, but you just know that they're not always going to be able to attend the meetings. And so they don't necessarily have voting rights because they don't, they're not there to actually vote. I don't know. Actually, we, we did put that in the letter that we sent to those 11 members that they're always welcome to attend the meeting, but they would not have a voting status. But uh, I think Mickey Brum specifically is asking to be kept on an active list. So. But what do people think? Um, let's open it up for discussion. Mm -hmm. That means people have to pipe up and discuss. So what do you, what do y'all think? Joe, go ahead. Joe, you got to unmute. Sorry. Uh, if she's interested in uh, staying uh, with the group, 
Да. You don't really have a good idea of, you know, what's been going on and what the deal is, or what the context is, or even why the vote was actually requested. Um, you know, it seems to me that if someone wants to stay informed, I think that's a great thing. And then the notifications and the attendance is always there. But the vote, I mean, it, it, to me, I, I would want to have somebody that votes that has someone has has had a presence in the meeting and has contributed and is active. And, you know, I would I would appreciate the value of that vote rather than having someone who is just guessing. I mean, I don't know. I, it seems to me that if you show up, you've earned the right to vote. And if you're not present, unless it's a, you know, a particular circumstance, illness or deployment or something like that, I, I, I get that. We can work with that. Um, that's just kind of my thoughts right now. Great. Thank you. Dr. Fisher. Um, of the other committees and work groups and boards that I'm on, the standard seems to be 75% of attendance is required um, to maintain membership and or voting status. And so that would be, you know, approximately nine out of the 12 um, previous meetings, depending on when they had joined. And so if a standard similar to that was set, then it would be the same for everyone. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I like that too. All right, uh, Gail and then Rick. Okay. Okay. Um, the thing is, she has a, a meeting conflict. Is she, is she like a city council person? Um, I, I don't know her specific, but I know that um, she either is elected to a board or appointed to a board or something. Uh, where the meeting that she must attend is in conflict with the COG meeting. Right, mm -hmm. and that's kind of not her fault. And barring cloning, I, I, I really don't want to lose her because she may wind up being able at some other point to come back and join us. And I don't want her to lose us. And so maybe... And if, she, and if she's aware of the uh, recordings, that can help her and she could maybe email in if she has something important she wants to say if she can't make it. That's all. I just don't want to lose her just because of a conflict because I know how hard that is because I've got a conflict too where I'm bouncing between two various Tuesdays. I've got two things on, on Tuesday. So I, I, I feel her, I feel her pain. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Empathy is a good thing, Gail, thank you. <laughs> All right, Rick and then Angela. Yeah, I was gonna agree with the, the previous two uh, comments about uh, having some type of a, um, or that the previous comment about having some type of a minimum um, requirement for uh, members and, you know, I, I think, 75% is good, you know, that's uh, missing three meetings. And I, I really like the idea, like, um, like, like Patty informed us that she wasn't going to be here. And I, I think if you have an excused, uh, an absence, um, you should try and let people know that you're not going to be here. I mean, it's, you really have to attend the meetings and, and participate in the discussions and listen. And it's really hard to do that um, after the fact. And a lot of times, you know, the, the meeting might not be posted for a month or something. I mean, it, and if you're trying to look at the, the minutes or something, um, I, I don't see how you could be a member and, you know, be an abstention for, for, for a year. I think uh, there's plenty of ways for people to be informed and, and you can, uh, the, 
these meetings are in public, so there's notes and you can read the notes, you can watch the videos and things like that. But, uh, you know, I, I think you've got to really attend the meetings to be a member. Um, and we, we should try and have, you know, some minimum standard. And then again, um, just like John said, if you're, you know, deployed or something, I mean, there's reasons why we may want to extend that for, you know, if, or if you're having medical issues and you've got to take time off or something like that, leave of absence. Um, but uh, I, I think we should have a, a minimum number of meetings that's expected. And we can always uh, decide something different uh, for special cases. Thanks, Rick. Um, Angela. Yeah, thank you. As an indecisive person, this has been hard because I, I see both sides. Um, I would agree with Gail, Gail and what was said before about um, aiming to be as inclusive as possible. And if there's community members that want to be involved, um, making sure there are ways that they can be. But I also see um, why it would be helpful to have some sort of like minimum, maybe not 75, but like a compromise of like 50% of the time uh, or something like that. But um, yeah, potentially we could have, I'm just thinking of like a compromise between the two um, people that want to join but maybe have scheduling conflicts they can watch the recordings and they can still email with feedback and different thoughts and concerns that they have but they just won't be a voting member um, but potentially we can come up with different pathways to make it more easy for them to be involved as well great thank you any other thoughts or comments on this So my, my thoughts are that we I, I don't want us to mix up two things. One is voting members, and I think you have to be present to vote. You can't like not be here and vote. Um, so like tonight, if we take a vote on this, people who aren't here won't be able to vote. Anybody can come and attend this meeting, and I think that's really important. I'd like to see us, in fact, have more people come and attend that maybe aren't members, but just have the time and can attend it. So I think those are the two things that I don't want us to get confused. Um, oh, go ahead, Rick. I was going to say um, we do have a proxy, uh, the ability for proxy votes. So uh, we don't necessarily have to be here. But, you know, um, if you want to proxy your, your vote or you can contact another member and, um, you know, have a written, you know, record of that, that you've agreed to that. So. I just right. wanted to bring that up. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Um, Sandy, so, can I clarify too, though, that yeah. if somebody were, for the new members, uh, when we had done um, the, the decision about the proxy vote, um, you have to let the other person who's going to be representing you know, but you also need to know, let um, a, mem a leadership team member know ahead of the meeting that you're going to have someone else doing your vote. Um, so that was kind of the stipulation there as well. Thanks. Um, so one thought I have is that, Mary, you had a lot of other things listed about membership that maybe would clarify sort of, I think the big issue that I heard people say was having expectations for member attendance and maybe we could talk about that, having the expectation for member attendance. And then that may help clarify to people if they're going to be members or if they're going to be participants, because those could be two different things. Um, so that's one way of just addressing this moving on, is once we have the expectations for people, then people can decide. We all have a lot going on, so I get it if you have other things going on. And I would not want to lose her voice in this, but I don't think we would. So um, do you want to talk about the next steps in membership here, Mary? Oh, and are we going to get, are we going to have all those other people then taken off the list so Kelly doesn't have to have the uncomfortable list of nobody here? I, I think because we voted on it last month that I think we can remove those people that we have not heard from at all um, with no problem. Um, the other, um, 
before we close this out, uh, would you like me to get back with Dave Norwood and with Mickey and just tell them, you know, what the discussion was and our thoughts that they can, uh, in Mickey's case, maybe go back and stay in touch as far as watching some of the previous uh, meetings and offering her opinions in that. But what I'm hearing is that most people feel that she should not be a voting member. Is that correct? Is that what people think? Like, do we vote? Do we thumbs up? Do we not? All I see is initials here. So I see one thumbs up, two. Yes, why don't you tell her that? Oh, Gail's got her hand. Yes, no, that, I'm, I didn't know how to do my thumbs up. And so Gail's so got I agree. all five fingers up, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I agree, that's, that's good. Gail's doing a high five, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, it doesn't mean that she can't contact us and say, my meetings have moved and now I'm ready to come back full force. So That's a good idea. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Mary, so can you send it. me a list of those people, please? Yes, I will. Thank you. No problem. Yep. Um, of the other things under membership, uh, the expectation of members, the onboard um, process and orientation, uh, I guess not recruitment, but the subcommittees. Um, in the engaging the public uh, subcommittee meeting that we had, we discussed the fact that because the survey actually came out quite late um, for people to be able to review it very well, that maybe it would be better to wait until next month. And I don't know if, uh, you know, between Portia and Lynn and anybody else who might be involved in the survey thing, if they feel that it would be helpful to take the survey and put it through like the survey monkey, uh, you know, process, that might give us more, more information as well as far as actually analytics or, you know, whatever. So I would be, you know, open to that for sure if anybody wanted to pursue that. Um, now, as far as recruitment, uh, we have not met as the membership group. So um, if anybody has specific ideas on that, we would be open to that as well. Um, I did take the charter and uh, application for the COG to the um, no defense uh, event uh, that Tony had, and I gave out three or four and of those, uh, there were two women who were um, from a university, I believe, and they were gonna share it with um, some of the students that they were involved in. And then there was another woman who um, was very interested, but she um, actually had just too much on her plate. She's involved with League of Women Voters and knows that with the uh, election coming up, she's gonna be overwhelmed. So um, she might be somebody that uh, in the future we might hear from again, I hope, so. And I Great. think that's it for me, so. Thank you, very Thank good. You. Um, the other thing that we had talked about, well, anything else for membership for Mary? Thank you for all your work on that, Mary. Oh, well, thanks to everybody because uh, we we did have input from the leadership team and other members of the membership committee, and uh, hopefully, people found it helpful. Um, one thing we did talk about was subcommittees, and um, you know, we're struggling getting people to participate. So the question is always: some subcommittees will kind of. Um, work out their time, you know what I mean? They accomplish their task and do we need them moving forward? Maybe there's new ones. Maybe the time of meeting is hard. I know for me, it's really hard to get back here by six, let alone be here by five to do a subcommittee meeting. So um, I don't know if people have thoughts on subcommittees. It's hard to have thoughts on anything at 7.15 when we've talked about 
stack emissions, but if people have thoughts on subcommittees and what they'd like to do with those or ideas, I guess now's the time to talk. Or if you're in charge of a subcommittee and have ideas, that would be a great discussion too. Because what I don't want to do is waste people's time either direction. Any ideas, thoughts, comments? Ridicule? Uh, this, is, this is Mary, and I can just share that um, the engaging the public subcommittee, we kind of range between three and five members, including Kelly, um, each month. And Brandon Thomas with MDHHS joins in as well. Um, I was kind of concerned too about whether that was really much effective uh, representation. But even Brandon said, you know, ha having the type of conversations that we do have during that is helpful. Um, helpful even for him as a agency staffer to, you know, be able to go back and, you know, share that with his um, clients, I guess I'll say. But um, so there's that. Uh, like the membership committee, we do not meet very often. Um, I think we'll meet a little bit more often right now because of these, um, the survey and, you know, the recruitment and things like that. Uh, the prevention, we had met pretty regularly for a while. Um, and then we got the um, introduction to PFAS 101 document that Dave and Kelly worked so hard on, uh, finalized, and that was put onto the um, MPAR website. And then Dave got extremely busy with the um, Need Our Water group and with the DOD uh, type things in Ascoda. So I think he's been, you know, just called away, you know, for that. And we didn't have very many people participating at that point. So there have been a couple of people who reached out through this survey who said that they might be interested in um, joining in into that. So, you know, we'll consider that as well uh, about that. Um, one of the things, and, and I'll leave it for um, next month when we do talk about the survey a little bit more, uh, one of the things that was brought up more than once was uh, the discussion we had previously about creating like a legislative subcommittee and not necessarily for the COG to participate uh, as far as representing ourselves with legislators, but as much in keeping our members informed about legislation that might be coming up. Um, such as polluter pay laws or, you know, specific legislation dealing with PFAS and that. So I think that would be a, a good option if members agree. Thanks. Cool. Um, any thoughts on that? Any ideas or conversation? Oh, everybody's getting tired. Okay. I'll jump in, Sandy. I'll say okay. here. Um, the one thing I'll say to that, Mary, is there is a ton of pending PFAS draft legislation, um, which I'm, you know, uh, not at liberty to discuss with uh, until it's actually introduced because it's not my business to be talking about other people's bills, but there is quite a bit of stuff going on. If it all gets introduced, then yes, we could probably use um, a COG subcommittee to, or, or maybe we just grab one of the other subcommittees or, or grab a new, create a new subcommittee for temporary and uh, have you guys review some of this stuff and provide comments. Um, it's not bills that we, you know, Eagle's not sponsoring any of these bills. These are all coming from legislators. So, uh, but I think that's, you know, probably a, a really good idea. We'll see how um, the spring progresses and see what actually gets introduced. But good thoughts. Maybe, maybe another thought is that we just put it as part of the agenda of upcoming legislation and we can let people link to that or something. If 
Yeah, people are interested in that. Rick, you got your hand up? You got ideas? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say something about the, the membership. Um, it might be good for new members to uh, maybe assign a, um, a mentor or, or somebody to uh, just sit down and talk to them about, uh, you know, our experiences and, and get to know them a little better rather than just turn people loose. <laughs> um, I know uh, it really helps um, when you join a new committee, um, you don't know a lot of the people or anything, but just, you know, just to uh, ask questions, answer questions, or just, you know, kind of a welcome to the committee, just be, be having a, a mentor or a contact uh, for orientation. I love that idea. Yeah. I think that's great. I think we've been missing that. Yes, Angela. Yeah, I really like the idea of creating a subcommittee for uh, state legislation, um, but I do think it's something that would be helpful for all COG members to stay aware of. Um, and so I'm I'm still brainstorming what that would look like, either having a separate subcommittee that does a quick report out or having like a new section in our monthly meetings that is focused on existing state legislation. Um, but I was also curious to hear, like, since this is like a state of Michigan cog, um, is there restrictions around, like, I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if there's going to be conflicts with the, like, potentially looking like lobbying versus um, if it's us giving support or not supporting state legislation. I, I think that is my concern is that I want to make sure that this is a this fulfills the mission that the cog is supposed to do and and doesn't bleed into other things that there's a lot of other yeah. organizations that do that. So I think that's why I was thinking more if we did presentations of this is a bill pending. Here's the education you could do yeah. with that what you want is a lot different than us saying here's what we want. There's a lot of us that still are doing here's what we want. But we're doing that as part of a different group. So that's just exactly. my thought. Abby, you got an idea? No, that's it. That's exactly what I was thinking. And I probably should have been more clear. Um, yeah, it'll be more informative, keeping you guys aware of what's pending, what's being discussed. There, Like Sandy said, there's a number of other groups that we can definitely um, direct the comments to so that we don't have that uh, conflict of interest with this particular group. But I think this is the forum that at least you guys are made aware of things that are being talked about and um, that uh, if there's legislation that's introduced, we want to definitely bring it to you guys so that you know about it and have that opportunity to have to part, be part of the discussions. Um, we, the COG should not be advocating one way or another specifically, but as informed citizens of other groups, you definitely have that opportunity. And and I think that's part of why, you know, there's success in this group is, is that you guys are informed citizens willing to make that difference. So, um, you know, you all have great, uh, great backgrounds and all kinds of experience. So let's, let's put it to use. I don't think that the COG doesn't have that ability, I don't think. That's my two cents. Okay, so let's not lose, Mary, can you make sure we don't lose Rick's idea of the mentoring thing? Because I think that will be really important as we move forward. So, um, okay, I think the last thing we wanted to do was topics for the upcoming year. Kelly, did you do a slide for that too? Oh my gosh, you are amazing. Um, so when we were brainstorming, we talked about some ideas of topics for discussion. And so these were just some of the things that we came up with. Um, somebody, I can't remember who talked about that it would be really helpful to hear, and, and especially for new members, kind of the whole idea from Eagle especially, but other ones, the whole life cycle of the site from when something gets discovered to what the uh, remediation may be or the whatever we're going to call that. Um, so that mm -hmm. there's some more understanding of what that is. I do get that a lot in my community of why aren't they digging this up and taking it somewhere? And so I think it's important for people to understand how that happens. Also updates from ATSDR, 
which is the Agency on Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is a federal arm of the CDC on the new health recommendations that came out. Um, some talk about Gen X and short chain PFAS, which we tend to skip over in Michigan, but that's also an issue. <laughs> Air testing, we just talked about a little bit. There's a few different health studies that are going on across the state that I'm sure um, MDHHS would love to spend time telling us about. Everybody seems to be developing treatment technologies right now, and I'm <laughs> open to other ideas. So I wanted to hear from people. Those were just some we brainstormed. If you like those, if you say, no, that's boring. If you've got other ones that we could add to the list, because then we could start kind of queuing people up to do these presentations as well. And that may also help us get more people to tune in because these sound just like an exciting way to spend a Tuesday evening. So let me know what you think. And B. Go ahead, Mary. I just wanted to uh, say that that would be one of the topics maybe for next month when we talk about the survey, but um, it did seem um, the two that got the most votes uh, as far as being higher level ranking was learn about PFAS contamination effects in people and how to avoid home, human exposure and protect the environment. So, you know, I think uh, there's a few on this list that would likely fall into that category. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, John. Yeah, I, I, I would like to have, I like this list. I like the two that were just added. And, you know, the, another thing is, you know, Eagle's a pretty big outfit and a huge organization. We have staff everywhere, right? Or they, they do. And I don't really know how to engage Eagle effectively. I don't really know what the timeline is. I don't know how to really, you know, who do I call? You know, I have a niche of folks that I deal with with my landfill topics, but other things up that people ask me about, you know, I don't really quite know. I have to go floundering around. Having something that tells us, you know, a quick reference list or something, perhaps just something already out there on the, on the, on the website that I've missed. Um, but how do we leverage, you know, Eagle's expertise and how do we find out, you know, who's, who's a resource on a particular topic? I don't really have a, you know, an idea how to go about doing that. So you're thinking almost like an Eagle 101. And then how to <laughs> use those research. I got to agree with you on that. I spent a lot no. of time trying to figure out from Kelly what exactly water resource division means. Yeah, yeah. and things are always, and I talked to water resource. I had my first contact with it. It was great. You know, it was really nice, you know. Um, but, you know, he was new to our area and we had a nice chat and we we're going to stay in contact. That's good. Um, <laughs> you know, um, something like that would be helpful. Yeah, that I and I think we've done something similar before, but we certainly can uh, see what we could put together. Oh, well, we could yeah. grow it too. You know, that kind of like a quick reference list or something like that. Yeah. You know. Once mm -hmm. again, Mike Jury is the human Google, and he just put it in the chat. So oh. um, <laughs> he he knows everything. All things go in the chat. Oh goodness. Any other ideas or thoughts? There's lots of information out there from other states as well. If you guys want to hear from some of our sister states or something like that, I can I can see about arranging some of the stuff that they're working on. Um, we've got, you know, all kinds of things going across on across the country. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's opportunities in maybe even uh, collaborating with some of your other, um, if there's other citizen groups that um, maybe want to get reports from or uh, talk with about how they've handled things with PFAS in their areas, so. Yeah. Abby, there's one thing I've been curious about, and this um, goes back to uh, the 2022 um, Michigan PFAS Summit. Mm -hmm. That summit closed out with a person from an agency in California, yep. and they had reported at that time that their legislator 
um, or their legislature had um, approved a department of 39 people that was involved in not only testing for PFAS and products, but also working with manufacturers on, you know, updating their products so that they're able to be sold in California. And yes. he also mentioned that they had already approved that that department was going to be expanded to 80 people. And I'm just wondering, has there been any updates to that as far as if they've continued to expand that department and if Michigan is going to be having anything similar to that uh, coming up? We do not have anything similar. Matter of fact, we don't even have the base of it right now. Um, so uh, Michigan does not have the foundation for that yet. Um, not to say that it couldn't be done, but we don't have that kind of foundation. I have not talked to uh, the people in California this year, so I, I don't have any idea as to whether or not they're, uh, they got all 40 additional staff people that they were hoping for. Um, but it does sound like they're continuing to go forward. Um, and I'll ask Mike Jury to jump in here and see if he's got anything else to add. Seems like they are continuing to add additional things to their to their products list that they're evaluating, but usually they look for um, alternatives or they look at um, doing product evaluations. So Mike, you got anything else you've researched from California lately? Uh, I was going to the, I was gonna look at their legislation as part of um, some reviews that you and I are doing. So um, currently the states that I'm aware of with PFAS legislation, and I'll probably miss a couple, uh, Oregon, Washington, California, Nevada, Maine, Minnesota, and who am I missing? There's probably another one too. Uh, I said Minnesota. So there's yeah. there's some of those out there, Nevada, if I didn't mention Nevada. So they all have kind of slightly little different They're variations different. on them. We've been talking with Minnesota and Maine to look at how they're trying to implement it. Um, so, you know, this is this requires people and funding and stuff. And it's yeah. um, some of these PFAS bans are are fairly uh, intensive as to what it would require for for uh, regulations. So, and yeah, I, I, mean, I don't want to lose sight of um, Penny put in the chat. Um, how to support local activity for PFAS testing or community education. I mean, since that is part of kind of what the COG is for, is to go back into communities and help do education and then bring information back to MPARP for the agencies. I think that's, maybe we could brainstorm on that too for a time mm -hmm. too, so that we're doing that. Because I think that's an important part of what we do, so. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that we could probably throw on this list is, um, uh, DHHS should be rolling out their community outreach program around um, uh, caring for your well and all of the uh, the work that they've been putting together on that. I will talk with them that it might be something that we could uh, get them to come present on their uh, their status of that project here in the coming months. So perfect. Because I really want to see that um, tailored in and dovetailed in with um, with encouraging people to do more of their self sampling around residential wells for PFAS. Because um, I do think that there's, you know, we're getting more and more people doing it. But I think, you know, there's always going to be needs. But if people can afford to do the sampling, it's really a, it's a, important people get sampled. Sandy, can, can you hear me? I can hear somebody called my name or I'm hearing voices, one of the two. No, it's me, Sandy. I'm trying to, can you hear Hi, me Liz. okay? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I finally, it's a new phone, so it took me a minute. Um, I'm really glad for whoever put that last comment in about communities, because I do think this is, this is what it's about here. And I was, I had wanted to say earlier, I was, I'm a little concerned when I hear that communities are not asking for public meetings because that was exactly what was happening in Cortland because the municipalities don't necessarily want there to be a public meeting. And yet the people who don't know or are not in the know <laughs> are remaining ignorant about potential 
problems right you know right near them so and it brings me back to the whole idea of notification and i i i'm concerned right here in kent county i'm concerned for and i say this frequently but it's still it's still important i believe there's new there's other dumping places in cannon township perhaps Cortland, or related to the wolverine and um ways to notify people not just educate them but to let them know about testing that's happening close by is still i consider to be very important and my concern and this is a long thing to put on the list i'm sorry but is how do we work with the municipalities so that they aren't the ones who are saying, oh, no, thanks, we don't want a meeting. I think that if the people, if you ask the people, I think the people would say yes. So, and Sandy brought that up earlier, too, about are there any public meetings? Or are there ones that could be happening, but just simply aren't? So, that's still one of the most important things I think we need to be keeping track of and working to improve. Thanks, Thank Lynn. you, Lynn. I think that's mm -hmm. important. We almost need like a public notification. Again, I don't want to say public notification again. It's a trigger. I want to say like, like public education subcommittee or something so we can figure out ways that we get the word out to other, other communities. I think that is really important. I so, think I would call it strategy, not just education, but strategy. Oh, I like that because even better. Because you, it's not just a matter of education. You got to know which people are, are, you know, helping to make these things happen. And there's also people who are thwarting the attempts to make things happen. Right. I mean, right. It, it, every municipality is different. And so, so yeah. Um, I, yeah, it's a 10 letter word. I counted all the, the letters of notification, Sandy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Those who are new to this group don't understand what I'm talking about. But yeah, we'll, do. We'll, we'll do that over a beer sometime. Okay, so All right. what I'd like people to do is, because I know it's late, um, is come up. If you have ideas, please email them um, to, to everybody so we can kind of build on this list and then let's plan on having these as topics as we go forward and stuff. So. Um, Sandy, before we close out, can I just read Stacy Taylor's comments? Because she, yes. for whatever reason, is not able to join in to speak. Um, Stacy Taylor here in Holly, they burned every week in the Falk Road dump. Incomplete burning was one of the concerns. Um, I was concerned by the incomplete burning. Didn't ever didn't ever suggest it was a stack. Um, that being said, I have significant health issues, including confirmed correlation to the chemicals, metals, and PFAS, confirmed by the past five years of work to date. Chloracne, PCBs, and industry in our area. For me, it is very personal. Uh, still many questions, but it is affecting me physically. LOL, still standing. So that's from Stacy Taylor. All right. I don't know if Stacy's still on, but I'm glad we got that in there. Um, I know it's early, but I don't, I'm not a fan of keeping meetings going just till the bitter end, just for the sake of doing it. So I'll open it up. If people have more they want to talk about, great. Um, anything? Thank you to Portia for joining the COG and for joining the meeting and for all the guests who are here tonight. Yes. Thank you. Hope, hope you all join. All right, our next meeting right here, March 12th. Be here. And, uh, Be here and hopefully we'll have some exciting EPA announcements. We're hoping. Fingers, everybody fingers gets their cross. fingers crossed. Yes, until yes. then. All right. all right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Bye-bye.